today. It is my very great privilege and pleasure to introduce Andrew Goldstone, a TF in this course. Um, Andrew is going to provide for you today the only relief you will get all term from my voice. So enjoy it. Um, on the syllabus, it says that I would be presenting a lecture on censorship in this slot. Um, that's been suppressed. It's actually. been suppressed. It's been that's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will talk about censorship um, somewhat uh, in my last lecture on Lolita. And in preparation for that for next week, I'd like you to finish the novel and then read his um, essay on a novel entitled Lolita. It should be bound at the back of your book. Um, Andrew is a fourth year student in the PhD program in English and he is writing a dissertation on um, the autonomy of the work of art in modernism, on that as a problem, um, on that as a um, subject to be questioned and understood in a deeper way than it has been up till now. It's a wonderful dissertation. Um, it prepares him very well for the lecture <laughs> he's going to give you today. So, Andrew. Thanks, Amy. So, on Monday, uh, you had three main themes that were used to introduce this novel to you. First is the idea that the novel invites ethical questions but also holds them off through parody in the same way that it uses the tropes of romanticism and romantic love and parodies them. Secondly, we looked at Humbert's techniques of rhetorical seduction and related that to a kind of intellectual problem that Nabokov sets himself of trying to make you identify with this villainous character. And that leads to the third big question we looked at, which is the place of Nabokov in this novel amidst the many layers, whether he crosses them or confuses them. And that, that's the question that I'm mostly going to focus on today. I'm going to bracket the ethical question and leave that for Monday's lecture. And the way I want to approach this question of the style in the novel and the question of aestheticism is by placing Nabokov in the context of literary modernism. So I'm going to outline for you a little bit what I mean by that term. And then I'm going to look at some specific uh, predecessors that Nabokov refers to and the way he uses them. And then at the very end, I'm going to try to connect that to Nabokov's exile and the themes of exile. So let's start uh, with an example. Uh, if you look on page 15, Humbert describes his adolescence, uh, his education. At first, I planned to take a degree in psychiatry, as many Monquet talents do. But I was even more Monquet than that. A peculiar exhaustion, I'm so oppressed, doctor, set in, and I switched to English literature, where so many frustrated poets end as pipe-smoking teachers in tweeds. Well, that's why I'm in graduate school. Uh, <coughs> Paris suited me. I discussed Soviet movies with expatriates. I sat with urinists in the Dumago. I published tortuous essays in obscure journals. I composed pastiches, Humbert's poem. Fräulein von Kulp may turn her hand upon the door. I will not follow her, nor Fresca, nor that gull. So this is a, a spoof of a poem by T.S. Eliot, which I've given you a piece of on your handout. So let's look at that for a second. Eliot's 1920 poem, Garantian. I'm just going to read a little bit of this so that you have a, the flavor of the thing Nabokov is burlesquing. Here I am, an old man in a dry month, being read to by a boy, waiting for rain. I was neither at the hot gates, nor fought in the warm rain, nor knee-deep in the salt marsh, heaving a cutlass, bitten by flies, fought. My house is a decayed house. And the poem goes on. And this is, this is the tone of a poem. It's a poem of crisis. Uh, a poem of a kind of hollow speaker, someone who emerges as more or less buried alive. And this is supposed to reflect both personal crisis and a historical crisis. Uh, and it comes to a moment where uh, the possibility of rejuvenation is described as devoured by a series of uh, caricatures of Europeans. And that's this second part on your handout, the people that devour uh, rejuvenation. Uh, so by Hakagawa, bowing among the Titians by Madame de Tornquist in the dark room shifting the candles, Fräulein von Kulp, there she is, who turned in the hall, one hand on the door. Vacant shuttles weave the wind. I have no ghosts, an old man in a drafty house under a windy knob. 
what in Eliot is crisis. In Nabokov is just a joke. In other words, these terrifying figures in Eliot, Fräulein von Kolb, are just some of Humbert's nymphettes. <coughs> Fräulein's just a young woman. Fresca, another Eliot character, the fresh woman, right? A young woman, again. So I called this a burlesque of Eliot's modernism. It takes something meant to be really serious and turns it into a dirty joke. And that's the first way Nabokov will relate to literary modernism. And it's quite interesting that he takes this approach because Eliot, in some ways, comes very close to the kind of ideas about art that Nabokov himself holds. Eliot says poems should be autotelic. That means they should be an end unto themselves. Nabokov will say in that afterward you're going to read, the novel has as only purpose to afford aesthetic bliss. So the parody is of something very close to home. And this poem that I've given you will come back uh, on page 134. You don't have to turn to that now, but you should think about that return. It's much more serious and strange. Okay, so that's enough on Eliot. Now I want to really clarify for you what I mean by this term modernism. It just means the art uh, and literature of the early 20th century, especially the high art, although its roots are definitely in the 19th century, especially the French 19th century, fiction and poetry. In English, it begins with the late novels of Henry James around 1900, in poetry with Eliot and with Ezra Pound. Uh, in, in prose, its main exemplars in English would be James Joyce, Virginia Woolf. And you should know about this movement that it had very rapid success. So although its first centers are London and Paris, it's already taught as classic literature in American universities before the war. It's already classic. So now, here's a, I'm just going to list for you eight features of literary modernism that are all important to Nabokov. Eight features of literary modernism. An obsession with the idea of art's autonomy. The idea that art is its own law, that it responds to no other laws, that it has no other purpose than its own purposes. In other words, art for art's sake. Right? That's Eliot's autotelic poem. The only purpose of the work of art is to afford aesthetic bliss. Second, a sense of crisis, uh, a radical break in culture, an overturning of conventional artistic forms that goes with a sense that civilization itself is being overturned. Third, the idea that the paradigm of experience is artistic experience, that the norms for everyone should be artistic norms of careful perception, uh, deep reflection, that the idea that culture itself is the saving, most important activity that people can engage in. Fourth, and this goes along with that, a rejection of convention, especially sexual conventions, sexual morality. And that's an obvious connection to this book, the very deep roots of modernism. However, at the same time, there's an idea that the artist is a kind of technician, someone whose values are craft, form, and style, rather than message, personal expression, or wisdom of any kind. Sixth, uh, this is a term from the critic Joseph Frank, spatial form, spatial form. The idea that in place of a linear narrative, you have a system of cross-references and repeated motifs that give the structure of works in place that is only visible, in other words, on rereading, only visible on rereading. And then this is, anticipates my last points. Modernism is self-consciously international. Uh, in other words, it will look to international tradition and it has as its ambition to be a culture not just for one nation, but for many, maybe for all. Uh, going along with this eighth characteristic that's important, the artist is seen as a kind of spiritual exile someone who is alienated from a home society and a home culture, whether or not he or she has actually left it, as Nabokov did. So this is what I mean by international high modernism. Uh, you should add to this list of writers, especially uh, Faulkner and Hemingway, and you should remember that there's a parallel American tradition, uh, the realist tradition that we saw Richard Wright referring to, that is Theodore Dreiser, Sinclair Lewis, and then going back to the 19th century, writers like Mark Twain. You know, I had a teacher who used to compare Lolita to Huck Finn. There are two novels about traveling across America in an unconventional couple, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm, uh, okay. But now, 
that modernist tradition is something that Nabokov owes a lot to, but he always tries to distinguish himself from it. Uh, for Nabokov, the highest value is originality. He says this uh, in his last Russian novel, The Gift, or he doesn't say it, his autobiographical hero says it. Any genuinely new trend in art is a knight's move, a change of shadows, a shift that displaces the mirror. Okay? Any genuinely new trend is a knight's move. So just to remind you, in chess, the knight doesn't move in a straight line. It starts out in a straight line, and then it hops off on the diagonal. Unlike any other piece, it skips over pieces in the way. So the knight, far from going on the straight course, surprises you. You might think of walking in here, expecting Professor Hungerford on censorship and getting me instead. Uh, but this is really a very important idea for Nabokov, both as a way of treating predecessors and as a way of writing. And I want to show you that way of writing uh, very early in the book, on page 10 now. Let's take a look at that. This is at the top of the page. My very photogenic mother died in a freak accident, picnic lightning, when I was three. And save for a pocket of warmth in the darkest past, nothing of hers subsists within the hollows and dells of memory, over which, if you can still stand my style, I'm writing under observation, the sun of my infancy had set. Okay, so this is a night nice move from the traumatic event of the mother's death should be the center of the sentence, is just dismissed, hop beyond into this stylistic wash, a golden haze. And he goes on to describe the sensations of early childhood. So the strategy of the knight's move is to frustrate your expectations, to leap over the apparently important events into something else characterized by uh, a kind of aesthetic play. And these parentheses are a real icon of that. A critic has counted 450 sets of them in this novel. Of the parenthesis, important example of Knight's move. But I want to show you another kind of Knight's move. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to talk just for a moment about Nabokov's relationship to the French writer Proust. Uh, Proust is the great aestheticist of modernism, the, the novelist who writes about art, who holds up art as a value, uh, as well as giving a theory of memory. And memory is very important in Lolita, that really comes from Proust. A theory of memory that has a lot to do with the work of the artist. Nabokov, in 1966, he said this, the greatest masterpieces of 20th century prose, this is convenient, take this down, are in this order, Joyce's Ulysses, Kafka's Transformation, that is the Metamorphosis, Belly's St. Petersburg, a pretty obscure Russian avant-garde novel, and the first half of Proust's fairy tale, In Search of Lost Time. That mention of the fairy tale should remind you of that first meeting between Humbert and Lolita described that we looked at on Monday, described in fairy tale terms. But actually, the thing I want to think about is a crude pun there, a fairy tale. Uh, Proust is himself gay. One of his big subjects is homosexuality. And Nabokov's reaction to this is really homophobic. Uh, this is not just about Nabokov's personal prejudice. It's about a relationship to predecessors who are seen as too similar. The danger for Nabokov, remember that his value is originality, the danger is that he will fall too in love with something too like himself. He has to hold off this possibility of being too attracted to these male predecessors who are too similar to him. Uh, this should cue you to think about the theme of doubling in this novel, to think about the possibility of desire between men here, to think about the word queer, the treatment of Gaston Godin, that funny French character in Beardsley, uh, to think about Humbert's contest, constant protestations that he's attractive to all women, about his supposed virility. Um, and uh, it should um, just make you wonder whether pedophilia is in itself a kind of knight's move from homosexuality. In other words, is there another form of perverted desire hiding behind the one that's in front of us. Let's look on, uh, just a suggestion, look on page 20. Still in Humbert's early life. Near the bottom. It happened, for instance, that from my balcony I would notice a lighted window across the street 
and what looked like an infet in the act of undressing before a cooperative mirror. Thus isolated, thus removed, the vision acquired an especially keen charm that made me race with all speed toward my lone gratification. So I have a kind of image there of the autonomous aesthetic pleasure, right? The pleasure of imagination that's taken alone according to one's own thoughts rather than in some m broader, more social form. But abruptly, fiendishly, the tender pattern of nudity I had adored would be transformed into the disgusting lamplit bare arm of a man in his underclothes, reading his paper by the open window in the hot, damp, hopeless summer night. So that, that the, the object of this wonderful aesthetic reverie, the nymphet, turns out to be an adult male. And I just want you to ask yourself why that could be. But Nabokov's relationship to this modernist past is not just the burlesque that he visits on Eliot, is not just this complicated attraction and disidentification that he works on with Proust. Uh, a part of uh, an element of admiration is also present. Uh, and that's, that's really part of his relationship to Joyce. Remember that he names Joyce as the greatest master of 20th century prose. Uh, just going to name for you four features of Joyce's style that are important to Nabokov. Stylistic virtuosity, the ability to imitate any style. At the same time, a scrupulous attention to the banality of everyday life in all its detail. Yet, third characteristic, the constant use of a superimposed structure. So in Ulysses, famously, Joyce puts the narrative of the Odyssey on top of a day in Dublin. Or in Joyce's earlier novel, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, a linear narrative in which a young boy grows up is structured as a series of structurally parallel chapters in which moments in each one correspond to the ones in successive chapters. And this has, comes with a, a kind of suggestion that that banal reality is redeemed by the, art, the artist's activity. Fourthly, Joyce loves puns. So does Nabokov. This is incredibly important. Uh, and there's a direct glance at that uh, just ahead of where you read. So don't turn here. I don't want to spoil what's coming up. But on page 221, there's a reference to, uh, don't look, don't look, <laughs> to uh, a writer named Vivian Darkbloom plagiarizing from Joyce. Now, Vivian Darkbloom, you remember from Monday. That's the anagram of Vladimir Nabokov. Uh, so it's a, an explicit recognition. And the thing that's being plagiarized, I've actually given you on the handout, it's a little piece of Finnegan's Wake, which is Joyce's work in which almost every word is a pun. Almost every word is a pun. I'll just read you a sentence of this so you, so you know what it's like. Say them all, but tell them apart, Cadenzando, Coloratura, R is Rubretta, and A is Arantia, Y is for Yilla, and N for Green Erin, B is Boy Blue with Odalisco, while W waters the florets of Novembrance. That spells out rainbow, right? Um, the important thing here is that Nabokov acknowledges this debt to Joyce as not just a parody, but a real debt. Uh, and so now I want to think at more length about another Joyce illusion, which uh, shows how complicated the relationship to his predecessor is. Uh, and with Eliot, I read the, the Nabokovian version first. This time, I'll give you the Joyce first. So this is on your handout as well from chapter 2. Uh, this describes the hero, uh, Stephen Dedalus, uh, as a young boy uh, writing, trying to write a poem. And eventually in the novel, he will succeed uh, in writing a poem. Uh, but here he doesn't manage to. And so this is a kind of forecast of what will happen later on. Uh, the further complication is that here he's writing a poem and then he remembers an earlier attempt, that layering of memory. And that kind of layering is actually a prototype for the layering in Lolita. The next day, this is under chapter two, the next day he sat at his table in the bare upper room for many hours. Before him lay a new pen, a new bottle of ink, and a new emerald exercise. Skip a little. On the first line of the page appeared the title of the verses he was trying to write, to E.C. He knew it was right to begin so, for he had seen similar titles 
in the collected poems of Lord Byron. When he had written this title and drawn an ornamental line underneath, he fell into a daydream and began to draw diagrams on the corner of the book. He saw himself sitting at his table in Bray the morning after the discussion at the Christmas dinner table, trying to write a poem about Parnell on the back of one of his father's second moiety notices. But his brain had then refused to grapple with the theme, and desisting, he had covered the page with the names and addresses of certain of his classmates, Roderick Kickham, John Lawton, Anthony McSweeney, Simon Moonan. The version of this that comes up in the novel is in the midst of Humbert's diary. Uh, and the, the diary itself, I should say, is a lot, uh, owes a lot to Joyce. And I've given you a piece of that diary to look at uh, on your own on the handout. Uh, but this is the moment that directly alludes to portrait. And it's really very important for understanding Nabokov's technique. So page 51, near the bottom. Thursday. We are paying with hail and gale for the tropical beginning of the month. In a volume of the Young People's Encyclopedia, I found a map of the states that a child's pencil had started copying out on a sheet of lightweight paper, upon the other side of which, counter to the m unfinished outline of Florida and the Gulf, there was a mimeographed list of names referring, evidently, to her class at the Ramsdale School. You might think of that front and back of the page as another kind of night's move. You, know, you think you're looking at one thing, you land on another. It is a poem I know already by heart. Angel Grace, Austin Floyd, Beale Jack, Beale Mary, Buck Daniel, and so on. I'll come back to this list, actually. Just skip to the bottom on page 52. Talbot Edgar, Talbot Edwin, Wayne Lull, a lull in the book, right? Williams Ralph, Winmuller Louise. A poem, a poem forsooth, so strange and sweet was it to discover this haze Dolores, she, in its special bower of names, with its bodyguard of roses, a fairy princess between her two maids of honor. That, that's the fairy tale again. In a way, this is just like the Joyce. A list of names leads up to this aesthetic sensation, the, the revelation of a poem. Uh, the ordinary materials of life become the basis for a kind of artistic achievement. However, obviously, this is not like the Joyce, where there is a realistic depiction of a young boy trying to write, getting bored, and failing. Here, something else is happening, because the list of names is not ordinary, right? There's that bower of roses. That refers to Mary Rose Hamilton, Hayes Dolores, Honick Rosaline, and then there's Emile Rosado and Carmine Rose, a red rose, Angel Grace, I mean, really? Uh, <laughs> Stella Fantasia. Uh, and then even the ordinary names are, are kind of plants because almost every name on this list comes back elsewhere in the book. You could look, for example, for Louise Windmuller or um, Vivian McChrystal. And then right in the middle, oh, and then we have Shakespeare too, Miranda Antony, Miranda Viola. Um, and right in the middle, you have a kind of explanation uh, planted. McCoo, Virginia, McChrystal, Vivian, McFate, Aubrey. McFate, which as you know is something Humbert gets kind of obsessed with, is the icon of the difference between the realistic world of Joyce and the already artificial, already aestheticized world of this novel. No one was ever really named McFate. Uh, McFate is a kind of parody of real randomness. You might think of it as having the same relation to real fate as chicken McNuggets do to chicken. In other words, <laughs> you might think of it as uh, a kind of artificial, processed, uh, bland, easily consumable version of fate. I really mean that. You know, one of the funny things about that debt to Finnegan's Wake is Finnegan's Wake, as a book of puns, is unreadable. Nobody reads it except specialists like me. Lolita was a bestseller. Lolita was a bestseller. Nabokov made so much money from it, he was able to retire to Switzerland. And you should ask yourself, what about this novel makes that possible? Why is that? That you have this McNugget version of the modernist novel. And I don't, don't really mean that to disparage the novel. But it makes it clear that there's some kind of difference between this and the works that Nabokov is looking back to. I want to think a little bit more about this idea of a McFate. 
there's a kind of short circuit between, uh, between the Joycean idea of taking ordinary life and transforming it into an aesthetic order, because the ordinary is already aesthetic in the book. In other words, chance is already faded. The thing that stands for randomness in this book, the thing that looks like ordinary detail, has already been arranged to give you artistic pleasure. Uh, that's why Humbert uh, can be instantly delighted in the list of names. This doesn't look forward to Humbert's poems. It already is a poem, uh, and it is a poem to the crazed, uh, aroused mind of Humbert. So the, the artificial has taken the place of the real here. And this novel really reminds you of that all the time. Uh, on 84, Humbert says, uh, Humbert's thinking of uh, killing Charlotte, and he says, no man can bring about the perfect murder. Chance, however, can do it. Chance can do it. And of course, the perfect murder does happen. Uh, Charlotte Hayes dies, uh, as if by a total accident. But we're aware that the accident is so perfect that it was arranged. So this is the kind of hand of Nabokov taking a narrative of real events and twisting it into something that makes a kind of sense, taking fate and making it mick fate. Uh, and I want to show you one more example of that uh, uh, in the scene where Humbert and Lolita have reached the hotel, the Enchanted Hunters. This is on page 118. Near the bottom. In the slow, clear hand of crime, I wrote, Dr. Edgar H. Humbert and daughter, 342 Lawn Street, Ramsdale. A key, 342, was half shown to me, magician showing object he is about to palm and hand it over to Uncle Tom. The coincidence, normally in real life, it would be a delightful coincidence to go to a hotel room that has the same number as your street address. Here, it's a kind of too easy icon of the correspondence between the place where Humbert meets Lolita and the place where he rapes her. And the book just tells you that, right, in one of those parentheses, the magician showing the object he is about to palm, the ordinary event, which is really trickery, trickery, a suggestion that nothing has been left to chance in the novel. Nothing is ordinary. Uh, and now as I come to my, my last section here, what I want to suggest is that this kind of transformation of arbitrary, real faded events into conspicuously artificial tricks, which you might think of as a knight's move on the real, fate, mick fate, uh, is a response in particular to exile, uh, in particular to Nabokov's condition of exile. An exile living in a foreign country lives in a kind of uh, denaturalized world. A world where instead of everything making instant sense, everything has to be decoded, right? Nothing is initially known to make sense. Everything has to be figured out and reinvented. In that afterward to this book, Nabokov says he had to invent America. He had to invent America. That's because he didn't know it already. It wasn't given to him. Now in a way, this is a terrible state, a state of discontinuity with the world you exist in. But it has a payoff kind of, a payoff which is the possibility precisely of inventing. Uh, and this is, this is visible everywhere in this book. Uh, one example is the transformation of housework. Uh, this is on page 179. My west door neighbor, West Door, who might have been a businessman or a college teacher or both, would speak to me once in a while as he barbered some late garden blooms or watered his car, or at a later date defrosted his driveway. I don't mind if these verbs are all wrong. Of course, the point is that they're all wrong. The point is that this cliched suburban life of mowing the lawn, washing the car, and so on, has been transformed precisely because Humbert is a foreigner into something you can laugh at, something you can enjoy, something you can enjoy, something that you can apply the knight's move to. Uh, and this is even a couple pages before explicitly described as something particular to foreigners. Because you remember Gaston Godin says about the school that Lolita's going to go to, the girls are 
taught not to spell very well, but to smell very well. Uh, and Humbert comments, that's with a foreigner's love for such things. Uh, the foreigner's love for this kind of move is a response to this denaturalized world of the exile. Uh, it's important in this connection to remember that the knights move as a way of avoiding obstacles. In particular, it keeps skipping over uh, forms of violence. Uh, there's that mother's death at the beginning. Uh, there's another moment in which Humbert is tracing his hand along Lolita's leg, and he discovers a bruise there that he'd given her accidentally. That's early on in the book. In other words, the surprise is a violent surprise. Uh, you can even look at the mention of a knight's move in this book. Uh, that's page 192. One of the lattice squares in a small cobwebby casement window at the turn of the staircase was glazed with ruby, and that raw wound among the unstained rectangles and its asymmetrical position, a knight's move from the top, always extremely disturbed me. The knight's move, which is just a playful way of describing where the window is, right? The knight's move is nonetheless a kind of wound or damage. So even as it's the prototype for originality, it's also something very disturbing and harmful. And that conjunction, I want to suggest, that conjunction has to do with the traumatic event of having had to emigrate, uh, having had to take up another language. Nabokov will say that his private tragedy is that, uh, let's see, his private tragedy, which cannot and indeed not be anybody's concern, is that I had to abandon my natural idiom, my untrammeled, rich, and infinitely docile Russian tongue for a second-rate brand of English, devoid of any of those apparatuses, the baffling mirror, the black velvet backdrop, the implied associations and traditions which the native illusionist, the fractales flying, can magically use to transcend the heritage in his own way. Uh, here, being in exile, prevents Naboka from making that knight's move. And you might think about that homophobic attitude to a Proustian past, the fear that it's too like what he wants to do. Uh, but the main point here to think about is that, that feeling of damage. On the other hand, uh, the critic Michael Wood has pointed out that Naboka didn't lose Russian. You know, he didn't lose it on the way while he was riding the boat. He decided to stop writing in it. And Wood says this, uh, Nabokov could appreciate language itself only after he had made himself lose a language and had found another in the ashes of his loss. A kind of economy, a, a balance between the loss of one language and a particular set of techniques that comes in its place. These techniques are really, I think, uh, the source of the most appealing writing in this book. Uh, and so let's look now uh, at one of those evocations of the American landscape, which I, I just think maybe are the closer the book comes just to pure beauty. Uh, on page 152. Oh, and by the way, this book was written on road trips. Uh, Nabokov's wife, Vera, drove him on thousands of miles of trips around the country while he was writing this novel and hunting butterflies. Think about that. Um, but here's 152, Evocation of the Landscape. By a paradox of pictorial thought, the average lowland North American countryside had at first seemed to me something I accepted with a shock of amused recognition because of those painted oilcloths which were imported from America in the old days to be hung above washstands in Central European nurseries and which fascinated a drowsy child at bedtime with the rustic green views they depicted opaque curly trees, a barn, cattle, a brook, the dull white of vague orchards in bloom, and perhaps a stone fence or hills of greenish gouache. So, so far, this is, the American landscape is already a work of art, already part of a European memory. Then something else happens. But gradually, the models of those elementary rusticities became stranger and stranger to the eye, the nearer I came to know them. Beyond the tilled plain, in other words, the already worked over domesticated plain, beyond the toy roofs, there would be a slow suffusion of inutile loveliness. A low sun in a platinum haze with a warm, 
field peach tinge pervading the upper edge of a two-dimensional dove gray cloud fusing with the distant amorous mist. And utile loveliness is kind of the key word of Nabokov's technique when he says the novel has as its only purpose to provide aesthetic bliss. So here's the inutile loveliness coming just from seeing the landscape as a stranger. Humbert goes on, there might be a line of space trees silhouetted against the horizon and hot still noons above a wilderness of clover and Claude Laurent clouds inscribed remotely into misty azure with only their cumulus part conspicuous against the neutral swoon of the background. Or again, it might be a stern El Greco horizon, pregnant with inky rain and a passing glimpse of some mummy-necked farmer, and all around alternating strips of quicksilverish water and harsh green corn, the whole arrangement opening like a fan somewhere in Kansas. So European artist actually appears again there with Claude Lorrain, but kind of made strange. Uh, given that night's move, given a new twist, so instead of familiar, incorporated into this profoundly strange, vast landscape that gets uh, Humbert's most appealing rhetoric, the rhetoric of an exile. But I don't want you to think that this just means everything's okay. Of course, everything is not okay. Even Humbert will tell us so. Uh, just a few pages later, on page 175, he talks about his journey. We had been everywhere. We had really seen nothing. And I catch myself thinking today that our long journey had only defiled with a sinuous trail of slime, the lovely, trustful, dreamy, enormous country that by then, in retrospect, was no more to us than a collection of dog-eared maps, ruined tour books, old tires, and her sobs in the night, every night, every night, the moment I feign sleep. You have to pair that with that other evocation of the landscape to see this alternate idea that actually this distanced crisscrossing of the landscape could be damaging. Uh, think of those other violent night's moves, like, like skipping past the mother's death. Somehow this has skipped past that the sobs in the night. There's, a, there's another version, yet another version, that relates back to that funny figure of Gaston Godin. Uh, and you know, I spoke about uh, Proust, Gaston Godin has a picture of Proust on his wall. In fact, he has pictures of all great uh, figures of French modernism, André Gide, the dancer Nijinsky, all figures of this kind of aestheticism, this belief in the, the power of art, and all gay, as Godin himself is. And Humbert has a kind of hatred for that, uh, this, which he voices on page 173, uh, sorry, 183. There he was, devoid of any talent whatsoever, a mediocre teacher, a worthless scholar, a glum, repulsive, fat old invert, highly contemptuous of the American way of life, triumphantly ignorant of the English language. There he was in priggish New England, here are we, crooned over by the old and caressed by the young. Oh, having a grand time and fooling everybody. And here was I. And the contrast here is between someone who has remained tied to that European past, remained comfortably alienated, and by that very means been able to fit into society, with someone who is in a much more ambivalent position, someone who's trying to become an American writer, as Nabokov says he's doing, trying to invent America, uh, trying to bridge the gap between uh, Russian and English, but always finding that English is only a kind of second best. Uh, uh, and he, in fact, it's more than that. He translated Lolita back into Russian later on, and he, he added a second afterward where he said this, that wondrous Russian tongue that it seemed to me was waiting for me somewhere, was flowering like a faithful springtime behind a tightly locked gate whose key I had held in safekeeping for so many years proved to be non-existent. And there's nothing behind the gate but charred stumps and a hopeless autumnal distance. And the key in my hand is more like a skeleton key. So there's a kind of lost paradise of European culture, which he can't get back 
even with this spectacular effort in English. Uh, so um, that suggests that it's not all to the good. It hasn't, he hasn't been saved by taking up these knight's move techniques, the defamiliarizing techniques. There's still a record of damage. And so I'm, I just, uh, I'm going to end a little early just uh, throwing out uh, an analogy for you. And it's an analogy that um, Nabokov himself tries to debunk completely in that afterward. So you should be skeptical of it, but then you should also ask yourself whether you can really do completely without it. Might it be that Nabokov's own relationship to American culture, his relationship to the English language that he transforms, is like Humbert's relationship to Lolita? That is, might it be that it's a kind of kidnapping of an American innocent by a cosmopolitan European for his own ends? ends which are seen as a kind of perversion. Uh, that's, that's that element of violence that keeps coming back, the trail of slime across this dream of transforming reality in this Joycean way into, into something saved, the, the dream of turning fate, the fate of a dead mother, or in Bokov's own case, a father killed by assassination, a brother killed in the concentration camps, turning that into this beautifully worked out playful system defined by puns and images and uh, a spell of rhetoric. In other words, uh, could it be that all of this uh, modernist technique that Humbert succeeds in putting to his own ends, that Nabokov succeeds in putting to his own ends, is not an unambiguous good, but a record of a kind of damage? Now, on Monday, you're going to hear about uh, this novel's confrontation with the idea that art could be saving, that it could somehow be redemptive. But here, I think, is a hint that it's something that the novel simply laughs at hollowly. Laughs at hollowly. Uh, and you might think of one last example. There's all these things I've been saying about the delight in words is the headmistress is put in the mouth of that horrible woman, the headmistress of the Beardsley School, Miss Pratt. On page 197, Miss Pratt says to Humbert, I'm always fascinated by the admirable way foreigners, or at least naturalized Americans, use our rich language. In other words, that the aesthetic discovery of English is something that just kind of fits comfortably into this prejudice of the, of the dull suburban American. Um, so I'll just end there with this, with this thought, this doubt about Nabokov's own use of modernist technique in this novel, about the emphasis on the aesthetic here, whether it could be not just that uh, triumph of the imagination that Humbert sees in the list of names, uh, but a mark of a wound that can't be healed. <laughs>